Hi, I'm Hannah Burak from North Carolina State University, where I focus on insect management in berry, tobacco, and other specialty crops. This afternoon, I'm going to be talking about spider mite biology and control in southeastern strawberries. And this really is the perfect time of year to be talking about this topic because February and March are the most important times to be planning ahead for spider mite control in spring fruiting strawberries. First, I just wanna highlight the basics in terms of spider mite control. You wanna start scouting for spider mites early when our springtime temperatures regularly exceed 50 degrees Fahrenheit for five or more days. That's the temperature at which spider mites become active, start feeding and begin reproducing. If your populations in strawberries exceed five mites per leaflet prior to beginning harvest, then you would initiate management. When you initiate those management activities though, you want to avoid pyrethroid insecticides because they can potentially flare spider mite populations. And finally, if you're using biological controls such as predatory mites, you wanna be careful to only select materials that are compatible with those predatory mites and avoid things like oils or soaps after you've released them. We're gonna highlight some of the key points that support all of these basic tips over the next 15 minutes or so. First, let's become familiar with spider mite biology and their life cycle. Female spider mites mate with male spider mites, which produce eggs of both sexes. You can see the eggs here, they're perfectly round and they're similar in size to a male spider mite. Males are pointed on the end while females are larger and rounded, but both have the characteristic two spots on either side of their body, which is actually segregated food products in their body. They hatch out of the eggs into what we call larvae. They're called larvae because instead of having eight legs like nymphs and adult spider mites, they actually have six legs. You can see the six legs on this larva here. And you can see it right next to um, a similar sized egg that it would have hatched out of just a little bit before. Larvae molt to nymphs, which have eight legs. And the nymphs undergo a resting stage called a deuteronymph in which they wait in their last nymphal exoskeleton prior to emerging as an adult. And you can see that this female deuteronymph is waiting or is uh, being guarded by this male spider mite who is gonna mate with her as soon as she emerges. And this is something you'll see really commonly if you look at spider mites on leaf surfaces and, their, and if the populations are large. So some tips on these guys in distinguishing them from other mites that might be present on leaves. Again, you have these characteristic two spots that are gonna be present at all life stages. You have the perfectly round eggs. They are hairy. Some of our other beneficial mites will not be hairy and they so if you have predatory mites and spider mites on the same leaf, predatory mites move much faster. Since it's wintertime, let's talk a little bit about what mites are doing during the winter. Their overwintering biology can have significant implications for how we manage them in our spring fruiting strawberries. And that's because the female mites enter what we call a reproductive diapause, which just means that they stop laying eggs when day length is short. However, the entire population rarely enters diapause, and that means while population growth is slower in the winter, it may not necessarily stop, and under certain conditions, damage may continue. But how much of the population is diapausing depends on diet, temperature, whether or not there are predators there, latitude, and altitude. So it's a complicated set of uh, conditions that result in spider mite diapause. And this just illustrates what a diapausing female spider mite looks like. She has less food stored in those patches on either side of her body, and she's salmon colored or orange, as opposed to being a pale uh, cream or yellow color. So this is old data from some basic biology work that was done just illustrating um, the effect that light and temperature can have on the amount of spider mites that go into diapause. And so this just illustrates that when the day length is even, equal amount of light and dark, but the temperature is cold, that can trigger diapause. When the day length is even and the nighttime is cold, that can also trigger diapause. 
But when the day length is shifted to darkness, it doesn't matter what temperature you're at, you don't have much of the population that goes into diapause. So in this case, temperature and day length can operate independent of each other. So if the temperature is cool, diapause can be initiated when day length is short. But if that temperature is warm, diapause might not occur even if day length is short as shown here. We looked at this under protected environments, specifically high tunnels in the Piedmont of North Carolina. We looked at this over the course of two years and we found that very little of our spider mite population enters diapause, regardless of whether we had a warmer winter or a cooler winter. When we had that protected environment there, most of our spider mites maintained reproductive activity all winter long. This is important for managing these guys because that means that if you have spider mites present over the winter, they could become active and begin damaging your plants as soon as it warms up in the springtime. We also looked at predatory mites and there's a suite of predatory mites, including Phytocelis persimilis, our most commonly used predatory mite that can be utilized for spider mite biocontrol. All of these species are commercially available at various insectaries and I can provide more information that, on that during our Q&A period. We tracked the biology of these, of these predatory mites over the winter as well, and found that depending on the year, we recovered some of all of the species that we looked at. So these predatory mites can overwinter under those same protected conditions as spider mites. However, they may not necessarily control them. So we also looked at the amount of mites that were present measured in mite days. In other words, the amount of days a given density of mites is present when we had these predatory mites present during the winter. And in some cases in one year, they did numerically reduce our populations of spider mites the following spring. However, in the second year, we didn't see a significant reduction in those spider mite populations the following spring. So they're present, but they may not necessarily reduce our populations. There are other natural enemies present as well. These include fly larvae, six spotted thrips, minute pirate bugs, both nymphs and adults, and spider mite destroyer beetles. These guys are also commercially available, although there aren't really good management recommendations for how to implement them in strawberries. There are effective management recommendations for how to implement our predatory mite species in strawberries. In addition to those other predatory arthropods, there's also a pathogenic fungus which can occur in southeastern spider mite populations. And this fungus can be very effective at reducing spider mite densities. And it's most common when conditions are warm and wet, unsurprisingly. Conditions that are good for fungi are good for this pathogenic fungus as well. However, some of our control tools that we use for our um, fungi that attack our strawberry plants can also reduce the presence of this pathogenic fungus. So if you can target your fungicide applications for things like botrytis to the most high risk periods and not make scheduled blanket applications, you can reduce the likelihood that you're gonna negatively impact this pathogenic fungus. But this fungus is one of the reasons that our spider mite populations tend to be smaller in wet years. All right, so let's just review our basics again. We talked about what our spider mites are doing in the winter, and now we're gonna move into talking about scouting recommendations. But before we do that, I just wanna hit home that we wanna avoid those pyrethroid insecticides when our mites are present. And this figure illustrates some efficacy data from a research trial I did several years ago, looking at comparing lots of different miticide strategies to an untreated control. Our untreated control is the blue line with the stars here but you don't really have to worry about any of these treatments over here. What I instead wanna highlight is this purple line, which, are, was, which was our brigade or our pyrethroid insecticide treatment. In the case of this experiment, we infested these plots at this red arrow and we applied our, all of our treatments at this blue arrow. And you can see we had pretty similar populations prior to those treatments being applied. And as soon as we sprayed our pyrethroid insecticide, the populations exponentially increased. This is why we say we avoid pyrethroid insecticides when we have spider mites present. All right, so let's talk about what we do use when we treat up for spider mites. 
First, we have to determine if their populations justify treatment. And to do that, we collect 10 leaflets, which is one part of this trifoliate leaf, randomly distributed per acre. We then observe those leaflets, which with at least 10x magnification, you can do this pretty easily with a hand lens, or you can use a microscope if you have that available. And you manage those populations when they're greater than five mites per leaflet. When you use biocontrol, those thresholds are going to be somewhat lower and they will base, be based on manufacturer recommendations. You wanna ensure that your leaflets are randomly distributed because spider mites are clumped throughout most fields, meaning that if you just sampled this area, you might not detect a population, whereas if you sampled this area, you might overestimate the population across the entire field that you need to manage. And so we wanna have that randomly distributed sample that's gonna come across all of these little patches throughout the field. You then wanna treat when spider mite populations exceed five mites per leaflet. And here I'm just showing you some work we did testing out different thresholds for action. And this was also a trial where we had to infest these plots because we didn't have a naturally occurring population in the winter here. And so we infested this blue arrow and then we began treatments following that infestation. And what we found is that at least in this experiment, we didn't have a significant difference between a five mite per leaflet threshold or a two mite per leaflet threshold as compared to treatments that were made frequently, that was every other week, or treatments that were made infrequently, which was every six weeks. No difference in yield, although we had a difference in total mite abundance when we sprayed miticide as compared to spraying nothing at all. All right, so let's talk about what the tools in our toolbox are. We have a range of different miticides available, lots of different trade names, which contain different active ingredients and have different modes of action. They also target different life stages. Some of these materials are active only against mobile adult spider mites, while others are active only against immatures, that would be eggs and larvae. Others kill both immatures and adults, and so they have a broader range of activity. And I've indicated their general efficacy rating over here on a one to four scale. These miticides aren't necessarily neutral with respect to our beneficial mites, however. And so I just wanna keep that in mind when you're thinking about using these tools. If you want to utilize predatory mites, while most of our miticides won't kill the adult predatory mites outright, they can impact the amount of eggs they subsequently lay and their overall fertility. And one of the materials that can be most tricky for those beneficial mites is fenproximate, which is the active ingredient in portal in strawberries. And so keep that in mind when you're selecting those materials as well. You wanna select a material that's going to be soft on your beneficials, particularly if you're intentionally introducing them. You also wanna select a material that is effective and doesn't have any resistance issues associated with this. And so this is work we did in collaboration with Rebecca schmidt Jeffress, who is uh, in South Carolina for a couple of years when she was working down there. We screened a range of different miticides to look for any emerging resistance issues in strawberries. This is what we found here in North Carolina. This is looking at two different strawberry populations, one population we collected from watermelon and our laboratory population. And in general, what we saw is that Vendex, which is not a material we would recommend for use in strawberries, is not terribly effective. It does not result in significantly higher mortality than our untreated control consistently across all of these populations. In addition, Brigade, while it occasionally improved control as compared to our untreated control, was often worse than our other miticides. Our other miticides were pretty similar with the exception of acromite, where it occasionally did not provide as strong control as other miticides that were tested. And this is something we are aware of, that there are some emerging concerns with acromite resistance. Rebecca did similar experiments in South Carolina and had similar results. This is looking at mortality of mites for the adulticide materials. You would expect that you would see high mortality and that is what we saw. We again don't see high mortality with Brigade and that remains a material we would not recommend. For materials that target ovicide, or target eggs or are ovicidal materials, we don't see high adult mortality, but that's again, not what we would expect. Instead, we see lower egg hatch with those materials. So Oberon, Sabi, and Zeal have low egg hatch as well as Nialta um, compared to our conventional materials. 
and here's the egg hatch in, our, in their untreated control in those experiments. And this work, as I said, was headed by Paul Bergeron, Rebecca's master's student, as well as Rebecca when she was down at USDA ARS in, or sorry, when she was at Clemson University um, down in South Carolina. She's now with USDA ARS in Washington. All right, so let's just bring it all back together and put those pieces uh, together one final time. We wanna start scouting mites in early spring when those winter temperature, when those temperatures exceed 50 degrees Fahrenheit consistently. And for us in North Carolina, that's usually about the beginning of March. So this is the time of year you wanna start having these conversations with your growers and getting them ready for that regular scouting. Next, you wanna treat when those populations exceed five mites per leaflet prior to harvest. Once harvest starts, we can bump our threshold up to 15 mites per leaflet. And if we manage our early spring populations, we rarely need to treat during the harvest period. Next, avoid pyrethroid insecticides. When mites are present, you will flare your spider mite populations and cause unintended problems. And finally, choose materials that are compatible with predatory mites if biological control is one of the things you wanna to use to control your spider mite populations. All right, I'm here to answer any questions you have as well as um, any information that we can uh, deal with asynchronously through our entomology page, our Facebook page, or our Twitter account. Um, so feel free to reach out.